My name is Hugues Lorange, Child Protection Specialist within the Child Protection in Emergency team in New York. And I am specialized in mine action and explosive weapons. I'm, I'm Paul Hessop, the Chief of Programs and Planning for the United Nations Mine Action Service um, based here in New York. Landmines are munitions designed to be placed on or under or close to the ground or on any other surface and designed to be exploded by the presence, proximity or contact of a person. So this is for exa an example of, of anti-personal landmine that you see here on the front. And I have a few other examples here that I can show you. These are anti-personal mine and as well as anti-vehicle mines. So these are very common landmines that we may find in more than 50 countries uh, as of today. Then we have ERW, Explosive Remnants of War. They come in various shapes and various colors, as it is the case for landmines. And they are divided into two families. So we have first the UXO, Unexploded Ordnance. So these are um, explosive ordnance that, that have been fired, that have been launched, projected, or dropped, and should have exploded, but failed to do so. So these are the unexploded ordnance. And we have the abandoned ordnance. Abandoned ordnance are um, those type of devices uh, that have not been used um, and have been left behind or dumped by a party to a conflict. These are abandoned ordnance. And here are a few examples, such a part of a, of a rocket here, which is an RP, part of an RPG. It's a, it's a kind of grenade. We have a mortar shell. We have a cluster munition here, very common as well, and a hand grenade. There are many other ERW, even a cartridge um, that has been that didn't explode actually can that has not been used can be um, an ERW uh, and children are tempted to collect these weapons uh, of different sizes of different colors and that are very attractive to them. IEDs have been around for a very long time but most people have probably heard of them as being called booby traps and, and an IED is basically an explosive device that is improvised in nature. So in its simplest form, it could be something like a hand grenade that has had the pin attached to a tripwire. That is an improvised explosive device through something which is far more complex, which might be in a car or, or being used in, in a house which has a complex trigger mechanism, it has a, a large main charge, and there may be different methods of initiation. But I mean, in simple terms, uh, an IED is an explosive device that has been created outside of the factory. Where IEDs are a real problem today is that, that a lot of the improvised devices are designed to be activated by the victim themselves. So they work in a similar way to a landmine in that the person who is injured or the people who are injured are the ones who, through the trigger mechanism, activate the device and are then killed or injured because they they activated it. They triggered it. Mine action is the wording, the name that we use to define our sector, our programming to address this issue of landmines and ERW, including some types of, of IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Mine action has a vision, and this vision is to ensure that uh, the world is free from the threat of those device. My action is also divided into five pillars. The first one is about demining or clearance. It's about getting rid of all those devices. It's about surveying the land, marking the minefields, fencing the minefields, getting rid of um, those explosive remnants of war through explosive ordnance disposal.
That's one pillar. The second pillar is mind risk education. In a nutshell, mind risk education is about behavior change. It's not about addressing the land, addressing the contamination. It's about addressing behavior change among people, among children, so then they adopt safe behavior. They report uh, where the devices are that will contribute to, to clear those devices. The third pillar is about advocacy. Advocacy for international humanitarian law. That's the Mind Ban Treaty, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, the Convention on Cluster Munitions. It's advocacy for mine action in a conflict context when it's not yet in place. For example, to integrate mine action into a peace agreement or into a ceasefire agreement. That's the third pillar that, that for which we have also a specific uh, module within this webinar. The fourth pillar is about what we can do after the explosion. Once it is too late, when once the explosion occurred, what we can do is provide victim assistance um, at, at national level, at local level, organize victim, uh, victim assistance uh, programming. We have a dedicated module for that as well, so I won't enter into the details, but victim assistance is really about what we can call secondary prevention or tertiary prevention. It's too late in the sense that the explosion already occurred, but it's not too late to provide first aid to uh, save the life of the injured child, to provide continue, continuing medical care, rehabilitations, um, inclusive education, psychosocial support, etc. About stockpile destruction, it sounds very technical, but it's very important. It's one of the obligations of the Mine Ban Treaty. You have to destroy your stockpile of landmines, of antipersonal landmines. And in a broader sense, stock, this pillar of stockpile destruction can be also consider, considered as stockpile management, having establishing safer stockpile management procedures. So then uh, munitions, uh, weapons are um, uh, stored uh, in a safe way. First, it is a child protection concern from the CAC agenda point of view. The CAC or Children and Armed Conflict Agenda is one of our framework uh, and a key one. There is a Security Council resolution 1612 and subsequent Security Council resolutions that address the issue of grave violations affecting children in, in situation of armed conflict. And one of those grave violations is maiming and killing. So the issue of landmines and ERW is one of the contributor to this uh, grave violation, maiming and killing. That is a key framework. At global level, we estimate that around 2,000 children are um, killed or injured every year. It might be more than that because uh, in many cases, the data is not disaggregated. That said, uh, the number of victims is not the only one criteria that we consider. The issue of landmines and ERW, mine action, has its own uniqueness. And I will come through this and explain why child protection in emergency uh, activist organizations should be involved in mine action. The first reason, the first factor that makes this topic so unique uh, is violence. Violence in the sense that the degree of violence of this device, the degree of trauma that population have to endure, have to cope with is very, very extreme. As we have seen, the impact, the physical impact of this device on children is ex ex extreme. 
um, when the child has the chance to survive, he or she will have uh, to cope with a number of disabilities. It's very rare when one of those explosions just lead to a slight injury. Usually, those injuries are very severe. So the degree of violence of these devices is, is very high. In a fraction of a second, uh, the life of a child will, will be changed forever. Another specificity that we have for mine action is that it's human made. This is a human made problem. So it's not like um, the snake bites. It's not like uh, when a child is falling from a tree. It's not like uh, all the disease. Here, there's a direct human responsibility for this topic. And the degree of responsibility of human being for this issue is very, very high. For example, uh, we could argue that road traffic incident is also a human-made issue. However, those uh, devices that we, have, that we have here on this table are designed to kill. A truck, a car is not designed to kill. A third factor that we have to take into account is the guilt factor. Children, or adults who have um, stepped on a landmine or who have been uh, playing with one of these devices um, will have to deal with this guilt factor. Even they might have injured other kid, children, other kids, other adults when they were playing with this device. Those um, explosions, those devices are so-called victim activated. So the one who activated the weapon is the victim himself or herself. And the bystanders are also suffering from that. So, so this guilt factor is, is something very compl complex and we have to deal with as part of uh, psychosocial support. Uh, children, um, for example, will be called by names. Um, they, will be, they will be called um, Mr. Bond for example, during all their childhood uh, by other children. The next factor that is very specific to MINDS and ERW is that many incidents happen when children are playing, simply when they are tampering with this device. So a child, out of curiosity, after, his, after a bombardment, he will go around his house and he will find off one of these devices and out of curiosity, he or she will try to play with it and it will explode. So when we analyze the data, we realize that it happens often when they are playing or when they are working. In most contexts, when the children are involved in herding, collecting firewood, fetching the water, um, this will happen. It's, it will also um, generate those incidents. For example, in some countries, the collect collection of scrap metals will be one of the main cause for children um, to be victimized by, by those devices. The last factor that I would like to highlight, and it's a positive one, a positive characteristic for mine action and for this issue, is that all incidents are preventable and most of them are easily preventable. Once a child understands that he or she should not approach those devices, he should not touch them or tamper with them and should report to adults um, whenever they find this device, then you save a life or you save a limb. And this can be done in conflict context or it can be on, in post-conflict context, but in any case, it's always preventable. And for example, Syria, in Syria, they uh, have reached about 1.8 million children last year. They estimated that the cost for each child was about two to three dollars. 
and they consider that for two to three dollars per child you can save a life or a limb because the contamination is high in this country and all those children were living in an, in an affected environment. So we should all advocate for more prevention in mine action and in child protection in emergency work. I think there's probably two, for me, probably two main areas where, where children are really affected by them. And the first is from a lack of knowledge, either because, of the, because they haven't gone through uh, effective risk edu education training, so they don't know what is or isn't dangerous, or what is probably more often the case is they've been a refugee or internally displaced, and when the fighting took place, when they return home, either their homes or the surrounding community has been contaminated and they're not aware of that contamination. And, and that then comes into the second area, which is the people who are often most affected by, by mines and ERW tend to be the poorest people. You know, cause if you've got money and you're not poor, you probably are either not the first to return or you don't need to live in an area that has been affected by it. If you then combine, poverty with the consequences of triggering um, a mine or, or ERW. If the breadwinner, if the father or the mother is killed or injured, then that family becomes even poorer. If they're injured, then they probably need medical treatment and they're less able to work, which makes the family even poorer still. And so you've got children are, are really badly affected when either they don't know about mines or when themselves or a family member are killed or injured from mines or ERW. So I think it, it really is, you know, in terms of the humanitarian impact, it, it's very tied to poverty and it's very tied to education and knowledge. Um, the other thing I think which comes into effect is the perceived presence of mines in ERW may stop other aid coming in. So, you know, might not be able to do a food distribution or a vaccination campaign or seeds and tools because the agencies or the, the NGOs that want to come in and do it are scared because of the perceived presence of mines or UXO. And then again, you know, if you're looking at schools or health posts, often those buildings are used in conflict for not that purpose. And if they have either been targeted or have been mined or booby trapped, then again, you can't go to a health post or you can't go to school if it's been blown blown up, mined or booby trapped. So unfortunately, NRW really does significantly affect children. And then in the more traditional sense, you know, explosive weapons are designed to kill and maim adults. When you look at what explosives does to, to the human body, it's, it's pretty catastrophic. When that's applied to a child, it's even so much more worse. So the consequences of these weapons and the way these weapons are used affects children so much more than adults even. 